Okay, thank you very much for accepting my paper onto this session. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the results of a um, sort of long-running program of um, investigation into medieval settlements, so later medieval settlements mostly, which is my main area of um, interest. Um, since 2005, uh, we've completed more than 2,000 one metre square test pit excavations. You can see the uh, distribution of them uh, mostly in eastern England here. Um, and the aim of the project was to uh, try and reconstruct the long-term development of the non-deserted settlements, the currently occupied rural settlements uh, that are still inhabited today, where it's generally very difficult to carry out um, any archaeological excavation. And obviously, it's not possible to do uh, field walking or, or aerial photography uh, or anything like that. Um, so the aim was really to look at the long-term development, really focusing on sort of the period from 800 onwards. Um, but there's a particular phenomenon to do with the uh, Roman material, um, which I've become increasingly sort of slightly puzzled and intrigued by, um, which then relates to the theme of this settlement, the early medieval transition. Um, so this is what one of these test pits looks like. Um, uh, they are all dug uh, by different people. It's been a big um, sort of public archaeology project. Um, but the uh, methodology has been very standardised. Um, the test pits are dug in 10 centimetre spits. All the spoil is sieved through 10 millimetre mesh sieves. Um, and the uh, finds from each um, spit, we give each spit a separate context number. Um, the finds from each context are kept separately. Um, the main uh, material we've used for analysis has been the pottery because uh, it's most widespread um, and it's uh, essentially ubiquitous in eastern England. We have a, a continuous pottery sequence, effectively actually from the Neolithic, but I'm not going to talk about the prehistoric at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, we do have the benefit of a, a continuous, a reasonably continuous uh, pottery sequence, though in fact the early and middle Anglo-Saxon period, the period between about the 5th century and the 9th, uh, does have very much less pottery turning up, but we do have pottery at that time. So I'm just going to show you a couple of the uh, sites that we've looked at um, in detail to show how this works. So this is Purton in North Hertfordshire. Um, it's just here on the map. And as you can see from a uh, helpful Google Earth, um, it's a nucleated village. All the settlement today is concentrated in one area, very centrally within the parish, with the parish boundary shown on the map there. Test pits we've excavated here uh, are shown, as you can see. I would point out they are not shown to scale. Um, <laughs> shame, really, because it would have been very, very informative if we'd been able to make every one about 100 metres square, but sadly not. Um, but as you can see, we have covered a fair area of the settlement. Um, and what we've done, of course, is then look at the dates of the pottery from the different um, uh, test pits, and we can show the distribution of these. So in these maps, um, the test pits, uh, they're each for a different date, as you can see from the uh, top right-hand corner. Um, the test pits, which didn't produce any pottery of that date, are shown as white squares, blank white squares. Uh, the test pits, which did produce pottery of that date, are shown as circles. And as you can see from the key on the left-hand side, um, the uh, larger, the more pottery, the bigger the circle, as you might expect. Uh, the distinction between grey and black simply refers to pottery that's found um, in, uh, with later material mixed in with it and pottery that's found in undisturbed contexts. I was initially quite concerned about the possibility of uh, kind of recent gardening and building and stuff, uh, moving uh, spoil around and, and introducing, um, uh, you know, finds that shouldn't be there or shouldn't be there in terms of the uh, earlier development of the uh, settlement, but actually I, I don't think this is generally a problem, but we've sort of got in the habit of showing the disturbed and undisturbed context differently, so that's the grey and black, so I sort of broadly ignore that. So what we've got here is the um, background prehistory, which I said I wasn't going to talk about, but um, uh, and again for the Neolithic, it's one or two pits have produced their shirt or two, uh, similarly from the Bronze Age was a little bit of a cluster in the middle. Um, 
Into the Iron Age, um, we've got a few pits uh, that are showing in the centre of the village, but again, there's very little. It, it's difficult to make much sense of it. I'm not a prehistorian. I'm not really working on this material. When we get into the Roman period, though, uh, we see something quite different uh, uh, showing up. Um, and uh, we can see very clearly we've definitely got a concentration of test pits. We do see uh, Romano-British uh, material, Roman period uh, pottery from this area and a smaller and less concentrated cluster in this area here. It's a shame, really, that in person we haven't been able to deal with this area at all. This is um, the, it's a scheduled ancient monument there, which now, we now ironically know less about the scheduled ancient monument <laughs> than we do about the rest of the village, but it will be there for the future. Um, so we've got these sort of two areas. It looks like we've got a sort of linear settlement in the minor British period up in this area along the sort of stream valley. The topography is very gentle, so there's, there's no great variation. You can see there's a stream there, and they perhaps have something more like a, a isolated farmsteads. There's nothing very uh, high status in the way of the Roman pottery. So going forward, and we haven't broken it down within the Roman period, because again, it's really beyond, beyond the area I'm particularly interested in. Going forward into the early and middle Anglo-Saxon period, the 5th to 9th century, um, and you can see both the problem and, in a way, the, the intrigue of this. The, um, none of these pits are producing, produce the Roman pottery, producing any early or middle Anglo-Saxon material. Um, and again, these are pits that have been thoroughly sieved and they've got down um, to the Roman levels as well. Um, we've just got one pit to produce the single shirt of pottery of this date. Interestingly, it's in sort of the same area um, as the smaller concentration of Roman material. When we get into the later Anglo-Saxon period, the 9th to 11th century, we can see we've got a very clear indication that the main area of the settlement today comes into existence at that time. There's clearly something quite interesting going on here. Uh, this is partly exaggerated by the fact that quite a lot of test pits were dug in this area because of some allotments and the local residents got very interested in them. Um, nonetheless, uh, they are producing large numbers of shirts uh, from the pits, and it really does make you wonder what's going on underneath this uh, Shedra monument, which is the earthworks around a medieval modern Bailey castle. Um, so one wonders if it's a high status late Anglo Saxon settlement as well. But the area of main Roman settlement is producing a little bit of pottery from a couple of outlying farms, but really not very much. There's a clear shift in the focus of settlement that has occurred sometime between uh, the Roman period and the 9th or 10th century. And it's not really until we see the village starting to grow into the high medieval period uh, that we see this area being sort of engrossed into uh, the existing settlement again, or the growing settlement. So that Roman area of Roman settlement very, remains very peripheral to the village um, uh, as it develops. I'm not going to show you all of our 60 villages for obvious reasons, um, but this is a very different sort of landscape. It's a very dispersed pattern of settlement. Uh, Carlton Road is, um, I can't quite reach it up there, but it's um, sort of actually the pointer on the Yeah, I'm just going to um, so Carlton Road is up here. Um, the test pits have been, uh, just as a point of reference actually, the church at Carlton Road is here. There's a sort of area of uh, quite a lot of settlement here. And then a lot of dispersed farms scattered across the landscape there. We've placed test pits where we can, again, um, the same principle as Purton. Looking at the data again, we have virtually no Roman material at all. Uh, with just two of the test pits, one single tiny abraded shirt from the deserved context of this test pit, and one from there. Apart from that, we found no material of Roman date at all in any of the test pits, and there have been more than 60 dug across there. Into the 5th to 8th century, uh, we found a couple of shirts in this area, um, but that's all. Um, and then when we get into the late Anglo Saxon period, we can see it would seem that the, the main focus of settlement is in this area, nothing around the later church. The church is 13th century, it's early, earliest fabric, it's probably uh, about that, so, well, by the 11th century. Um, and we've also got some, um, uh, some of these outlying settlements are clearly in existence in the late Anglo Saxon period. So we can see how the settlement pattern is developing by that time. 
And again, we can see how it's grown and becoming more concentrated then. Though interestingly, even when we know the church is in existence, there's virtually nothing that would be sufficient in the amount of pottery to indicate settlement in this area. Here, remember, this is where the Roman pottery, such as it was, came from. Generally, we have remarkably little Roman pottery from these test bits. This shows a map of all of the test bits in eastern England um, with the percentage of pits which have produced more than a single shard of Roman pottery. Now, these test bits are only small, but we are sieving them. Roman pottery is visible, easily recognisable, generally shows up quite well. Um, and we're getting remarkably little of this material turning up. Uh, less, of course, in the early Anglo-Saxon period and into the late Anglo-Saxon period, we, we see it starting to pick up again. I'm becoming increasingly, uh, I think, interested in this absence of Roman pottery. Um, we can see when we look overall, this is work done by uh, Clancy Cooper, did a master's um, dissertation looking at some of this material. We can see when we look at the um, the pottery we've got, uh, here's the Roman amounts, late Anglo-Saxon, and then into the high medieval. So we've got reasonable numbers of sherds turning up, and the weight of the sherds is the same as the Anglo-Saxon material. But actually, there's still remarkably little, fewer than 10% of the test pits, 8.9% of the test pits, are producing more than a single sherd of Roman pottery. And that's very surprising when you start to look at the density of Roman settlement that is indicated in this part of England from field walking. Uh, so this is Bath and Bendish in Norfolk. The concentrations here are showing, uh, this is for the Roman period. You can see the concentrations which are indicating settlement here. I think I've got them highlighted, actually. And um, I just wanted to uh, point out that this is a kilometre. This scale is one kilometre. So you can see how close these settlements are, these concentrations of Roman pottery um, and how they're clustering around the village. And the presumption often is that there'd be more underneath the existing villages. And we see this again and again. This is from Hales, Hecking and Lawson in uh, eastern Norfolk. And again, we've got this same pattern of uh, dense concentrations of pottery finds from field walking uh, within a kilometre of each other. And they're quite large concentrations. Again, Rawns in uh, Northamptonshire, just beyond our study area, the same pattern. So we've, and, and just to use a different technique, this is a, um, a road, um, excavations along the line of a road, showing uh, the frequency with which uh, Roman uh, settlements are turning up on this. And again, that's the one kilometre scale. So looking at this, you'd kind of expect more Roman pottery to turn up. Almost, if you were putting the late Anglo-Saxon and medieval settlements down at random, I started to think you would expect more of them to hit a Roman settlement. Roman settlements are big, they have lots of pottery. The Anglo-Saxon and medieval settlements we've dug are big. Um, they cover large areas, they cover five, six, seven hundred metres. We're getting Roman settlements every kilometre. You'd expect, expect more Roman material to turn up, I think. So I'm starting to wonder if the uh, medieval sites, uh, and most of these are found in the late Anglo-Saxon period, and some may well have middle Anglo-Saxon foundations, are they actually deliberately avoiding these sites? And I've kind of avoided or tried to avoid coming to this conclusion, because I'm not sure I feel terribly comfortable with it. But um, when you look, at the, the, the suggestion is perhaps reinforced when we look again at Perton and see that when the Anglo-Saxon settlement, if you remember, was here, um, did re-establish itself, it avoided that area of former Roman settlement. It's not moving back to the, the streamside area that you'd think might be the most um, preferable location anyway. And we see this happening often. This is Cheddarston. Um, uh, sorry, I meant to put maps in at least. This is another site. You can see here's where the Roman material is actually Roman villa and associated material around this. Uh, but the medieval settlement and the Anglo-Saxon settlement is in this area. The Roman material is on the edge again of the settlement. We see this again and again, I'll just show you a couple more. Chambre, the Roman material turning up right on the edge. This is all modern 1960s housing estate here. Um, the uh, core of the Anglo-Saxon medieval village is up in this area. And again, at Nayland down in uh, South Suffolk, North Essex. Again, Roman material very much on edge. Again, this is 
uh, modern 20th century housing here, the centre of the uh, medieval villages here and in this area. And Binham, again, which has a very distinguished uh, Middle Anglo-Saxon archaeological record, which I won't go into, but when we look at the evidence, this is where the Roman material is, uh, the medieval and Anglo-Saxon settlement is uh, along here, but not on the whole around here, although there's some interestingly Middle Anglo-Saxon material about which I'm not going to go to. The only settlement that we have a significant amount of mater Roman material from in the centre of the medieval settlement is Long Melford. Here's the concentration of Roman material, but even here, when we actually take this forward, and we have no early or Middle Anglo-Saxon pottery from Long Melford at all, there have been over 70 test kits, I think, from Long Melford. We can see when we get to the late Anglo-Saxon period, the 9th, 11th century, this is where the settlement is concentrated. This area where all the Roman material is not where that settlement's re-establishing itself. And this similar pattern actually is, is, is apparent when you look in other places. This is from work in Buckinghamshire done by Richard Jones. And again, you can see the uh, Romano British settlements um, are away from the medieval settlements and the areas of the handmade pottery. Well, the handmade pottery is close to the Roman ones, but it is away from the medieval settlement foci. And I apologise for this, it's a very difficult site to photograph. This is Shatwick in Somerset, the first place really where extensive test fitting was done. And again, you can see here, this is all the Roman material they found uh, in the centre of this village, which extends across this area. And uh, you can see some of the medieval pottery there. Unfortunately, in Somerset, they don't really have uh, very much um, pottery pre about 1200 anyway. So to summarise, um, this dearth of Roman pottery, I think, is unexpected. It isn't given the density of settlement. We would expect to see it more often, I think. Um, and when we do find it, it's very much on the margins of the settlements and beyond the, the medieval footprints and certainly beyond the late Anglo-Saxon footprints. And we can see this pattern widely across East Anglia and beyond. And I am just starting to think there is a pattern of deliberate avoidance. Um, I don't know why, and if anyone has any suggestions, I would be delighted. Um, is it different economic drivers? Are they wanting to site settlements in different places because they're exploiting different resources? Um, sorry, these have obviously gone out of order. Is it, um, is it sort of a rejection of brownfield land? Are the Roman sites considered sort of, you know, there's too much old building kicking around, they don't want to use those sites? Is it a cultural apartheid? I think that's probably unlikely, if only because when we do find the early Anglo-Saxon handmade material, it tends to be closer to the Roman material, if anything, although, if we get Ipswich ware from the Middle Anglo-Saxon period, that's often closer to the Late Anglo-Saxons. There does seem to be a break around about 680, 700, but our pottery dating isn't, we don't really find enough to be very confident of that. Is it ideological reasons? We're, t reasons. We're talking about period of Christianization and the, the uh, introduction of Christianity um, to this uh, part of uh, England. Um, is there some refoundation, some notion that uh, new settlements founded as Christianity expands should be away from earlier settlements. Is there a superstitious avoidance? Are these places considered unlucky? And I put this in really almost as a slightly wry suggestion because um, what I've really been working on with this material more recently is looking at the impact of the Black Death, the 14th century epidemic of plague on these settlements, which is dramatic, um, extremely dramatic. and. Looking at this, this possibility that there's a shift from the, from the sort of 7th century that people are avoiding these earlier sites, I just start to wonder about the impact of the Justinian plague. So thank you very much for listening to this. It's very speculative and I would be very interested in any comments, questions, ideas, indeed solutions. Thank you. <laughs>